Hi everyone, and thank you for being a part of our Net Zero Carbon Summit today. For this chat, we're going to actually explore exactly what it takes to strategize, build, and execute a sustainability program. And to help us examine those strategies, joining us is Ray Fenley, the Chief Information Officer for AIT Worldwide Logistics. Ray, how are you doing today? Good, Grace, thank you. Good to see you again, and thanks for having me, and happy Earth Day 2022. Yes, it's uh, one of my favorite holidays. You know, Michigan is known for its beautiful lakes and beautiful scenery, and we we're not going to have that unless we're, you know, focusing on sustainability initiatives down the line. So I I'm excited for this chat as well. Um, and for you, I'm really interested in as a business leader, why is sustainability so important, and why should every business out there, even outside of logistics? Uh, be looking to strategize some type of uh, sustainability program within their four walls? Yeah, thanks for the question, uh, Grace. I think, well, first, I think uh, most high-performing logistics companies will have elements of a sustainability program, at least already operating in some form. You know, for example, they may have a robust compliance or regulatory policy or perhaps um, some other elements of maybe how they're dedicated to their employees or charitable events and so on. Um, however, I think a well-built and efficient sustainability program is about being more dedicated, a more dedicated commitment to a company's culture and sort of business quality, and more important, importantly, or as important, I should say, uh, business continuity planning. And I think that's really where, uh, at its core, a sustainability program is a roadmap uh, to how a company can create a more resilient and sustainable future. Um, you know, remaining true to a company's culture as well. So you're not going too far away from what's important to the organization, but really creating resilience. Um, additionally, I believe we've reached an inflection point during the past two years, and, and especially at the early stages of the global pandemic, uh, COVID drew out the need for a company to ha have good sustainability planning. Uh, teammate safety, for example, became a paramount concern. We, we suddenly started talking about the safety of our employees, which was, was mission critical. And following that, uh, companies had to figure out, you know, how to move most, if not all, of their employees to a work from home program. I guess in some ways, Grace, you know, COVID, you know, showed uh, firms that had excellent foundational cultures and 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 programs in place. They just fared just far better than 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 others that didn't have that. Um, and I'd certainly, you know, make a comment, Grace. Just I would certainly comment that what we've noticed is uh, personally what I've noticed is about 80% of all the questions we get. Uh, from customers about sustainability have really come in in the last 15 to 18 months. We're getting a tremendous amount of attention from customers on what we're doing and how we're going about, uh, you know, a sustainable program at, at, at the company. Yeah, the, I think it was right about this time last year the EU put out that uh, sustainability report. And I think for the whole world, it was pretty shocking because it involved so many different countries, I want to say 14,000 different studies. And, and honestly, it involves a lot of countries that uh, don't wouldn't want to promote sustainability programs, whether they're exporting a, a huge amount of oil or kind of pushing against what that those studies are showing, but still said, no, this is a huge problem. So I think once that happened, everyone as a whole across the world said, you know what, there's there's no turning back now and we need to start improving in general yeah uh for for you i'm interested in you mentioned the business continuity aspect of this can you describe what you mean by that and why it's important for businesses yeah so i think a couple of a couple of elements is one um sustainability is actually a it's a, it's a core fundamental part to a company it's about how an organization uh plans itself out the various elements are are hint, uh, hinged around environmental social and governance but within those there's many different factors grace so all of those components are very very important to an overall strategy it's not just about carbon footprint well that's immensely important it's not just about that it's also about how we take care of people our DEI planning, diversity, equity, and inclusion planning, for example, our health and safety of our employees is very important. Uh, charitable and community involvement is, is mission critical too. So I think all of those components combined just bring up uh, an organization's uh, ability to, to be sustainable in that in environment. But the continuity part comes from places such as regulatory and compliance. Uh, cybersecurity is part of, of sustainability and, and a huge part of it, in fact, 
um, as we've seen uh, recently with you know um, in our industry being targeted by hackers and so on it is important uh, to have those components together as well so it involves a lot of different people uh, within an organization uh, to, to create something that puts us in a in a uh, in a method to be able to be, have a business continuity plan if or when the need arises that there's there's uh, additional pressures put on a, on a company because of external forces. Of course, and, and as a leader, how do you go about even starting a program like this? Like, what first steps would you offer to people? That's a, that's a great question. So I, I definitely I definitely have some input here. I think what's very important is that as a good and robust sustainability program is not a top down program. It's definitely uh, this is definitely about it's a collaborative program. This is definitely about a bottom up and and side to side uh, approach to. Um, building the plan, you definitely need to engage a lot of stakeholders and contributors from a, across your company to start with. So you need your human resources specialists, your operations teams, your compliance groups, um, your information and technology people or uh, information technology people are very important in this process. And I'd also suggest that you take a look at what you have in place. You probably have components uh, of this already in place, whether that be the items I mentioned earlier, such as regulatory and compliance or perhaps maybe have a good cybersecurity uh, planning in place, you have some components already there. But uh, I, I would definitely say that it's that's what you're building upon. And for some uh, people in the industry, you know, you may already be working with SmartWay or may already have charitable initiatives. Um, that's where you would, you know, begin the process. Start with what you have, but get a lot of input from the people around you. Uh, it's very, very important to get input as you, you begin the process. Is that, what other, like, uh steps would you take regarding business stakeholders and uh, different employees that you already have especially you, know, you bring up culture right and i think that part of this is culture and you probably want to hear from every level of employee at a business on how we could be better as a group right so how how do you go about communicating that and getting everyone involved in that discussion that's great. I, I, I um, so something I learned personally learned as we began our process some time ago um, is is the importance of a materiality assessment or study, and um, basically that's just simply leveraging all of your stakeholders' inputs and insights to really drive change on material matters to your company uh, that are important to your company. So stakeholders, in this case, I'm referring to uh, your, your naturally your teammates within the organization, your customers, your vendors, and any other interested parties necessary, uh, of course, as well, that would be necessary to understanding uh, the importance of um, uh, the topics that you're going to tackle. So a, a very simplified example of that, a super simplified, is that you know we are a non-asset based logistics firm. So our materiality study is going to look very very different than someone perhaps who's you know um, you know has trucks and planes etc. that are are moving you know across the the country or the world. Um, so a materiality study can help you define the important topics and, and the areas that you need to address and ensure that you put your focus in the correct direction. And then at the end of that, at the end of our materiality study, and we had all these various topics, we used a heat map uh, to model out um, what was important. We, we, we learned from um, you know, customers how important diversity, equity, and inclusion was to them and how important uh, the employee safety programs were. They, our customers actually placed that even higher than our teammates did. So uh, that's something that you can't understand until you do something like a materiality study. Definitely recommend that. And you can find out a lot about that on the internet. Uh, and you know, there's lots of places to look up that. When you start building out these different strategies, was there anything kind of like what you just brought up, but that was eye-opening to you that uh, could be helpful towards um, limiting your carbon footprint as a business, especially one, like you said, who doesn't actually you know, might not have those assets in house, whether you're like your small brokerage, what are small ways that you could start to limit your carbon emissions without having to worry about the truck? Yeah, so at first, um, I think I, I'd start, I just at least suggest that I'd start with, a, you know, think out your plan, you know, have a written plan, you need something that's measurable, you need to understand what your carbon footprint is today understand how you know you can move forward it's really not about you know pressing a button and then the job's done uh, grace it's really about a it's a journey and it's about it's it's development it's taking where you are today and then going and moving um, to you know if you're planning to try and get the carbon neutral or, or net zero targeting for example you have to have the target first so you have to know where you are 
and and then move down the line. And what I would suggest uh, to the audience is, you know, start your process. Maybe first of all, there's a lot of studies already done, and there's a lot of uh, information that's already out there. So I would start the process with reviewing and reading information from uh, UN SDG, which is the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. And um, there's 17 of them uh, of those goals, uh, which are will help you think about your own company targets. So it's a great place to start. After that, for carbon emissions specifically, I would definitely suggest to do some research on uh, science-based target initiatives. There's some great Wikipedia sites and informational sites on the internet that'll uh, talk about science-based targeting. And that's a great place to start. It's a, at least an initial lead in as to how you can start to uh, set goals uh, and understand the mission to, to begin carbon reduction. We bring up goals, and I think that's incredibly important that you pointed that out, the fact that uh, you can't just you know throw something out there. But there are a lot of organizations I do see, and a lot of um, <laughs> maybe even large like OEMs sometimes that throw out sustainability goals of, of being carbon neutral or uh, no footprint by like the next two years. Things that are deep down inside you're like, is that even attainable? What are your thoughts on on some of the goals that you hear thrown out there today and um, do you think that there's better ways to to relay that message and and those strategies and the programs that you're doing without maybe pandering to your audience per se? <laughs> yeah, no, great, great point. I, I think um, you have to study your company's, uh, there's two, two parts to this. I definitely need to study your company's direct and indirect impact on the environment in this space. Um, so let me just maybe explain. Direct impact would be your electricity usage, or perhaps you have green building initiatives in your facilities. Um, how your employees get to work. You know, do you incentivize them to use public transport or not, depending on the cities that you live in uh, across the, the world? Um, do you operate on-site data centers or do you operate from the cloud? Are you a member of SmartWay? Um, those are direct areas where you can participate in um, putting together some initiatives that can help reduce carbon footprint. Again, uh, you know, whether it's ensuring that your monitors are turned off on your computers at night, um, it's, it's the small things, but they all add up, um, uh, Grace. And what I would say is that's number one. Number two is the indirect. And of course, this is the more complicated one. Um, for us, as, as you know, AIT being a non asset based provider, our core vendors are the people we do business with, our airline steamships and the trucking partners that we have. Um, I would certainly recommend to the audience to to work with people if you're non-asset based in particular but also if you're asset based and you're you're working with other other firms um you know get with companies that have robust programs or at least developing programs for green initiatives um many many companies out there you even see it when you board aircraft today a lot of aircraft um, commercials are now talking about their their mission to get to net zero um targets and those are the types of people I think if you're coordinating and um, uh, you know working with those folks, um, you're going to have a much, much better time of, of uh, working through those indirect impacts. Uh, it's, it's extremely important to be working with people that are like-minded. Definitely. Well, and especially when if you think of like more brokers or maybe logistics providers, um, you, you almost start getting to that scope three, right, emissions where they're just so much more difficult to track. I'm wondering from your perspective, how do you work with your partners, like your carriers or your transportation providers um, to have them a part of this conversation and, and have the, and make sure that they're doing their part as well? How do you put it together that type of communication between between them? Yeah, I think that's good. Just just good partnership in Grace. I feel uh, we have a, a very very a dynamic uh, procurement and and vendor uh, management program within our organization that really uh, focuses on quality and partnershiping. The true sense of partnershiping that we can't do our jobs without the excellent partners we work with and um, ensuring that we understand their initiatives and that we're aligning with their initiatives in, in, so, in some part at least, maybe not in whole, but, but certainly in some part, and that we're uh, co collaborating and working with them. We actually, uh, within the organization uh, today, we're actually able to report on carbon footprint by transaction, Grace, as an example. So we've worked with our partners to understand, um, uh, just for purpose of an example here, if a transaction is leaving Chicago where I'm based, 
Um, the pickup of that transaction, we know how much uh, fuel is burned. We know our carbon footprint at that stage. We also work with the airlines to understand our carbon footprint as we travel, perhaps to, if we're going to Frankfurt, Germany. Um, and then also the delivery on the other, other side, um, we, we're able to track all of that and provide that information to a customer today. So we can show them carbon footprint right down to transaction level. Working with your partners can help expose that type of detail. Yeah. You know, it's, it's interesting. I was um, watching an interview with your uh, chief executive officer and he brought up the fact that you really try to focus on being 50% domestic, 50% global. Um, with that being said, is, there, is it easier to set up the domestic sustainability programs than it is globally and, and how do they differ? Yeah, it's interesting. That statistic has changed dramatically. I've, I've been with the organization uh, this year. It'll be it'll be 27 years. It's funny how that uh, that statistic has changed. We over 70 percent of our activities are now global, Grace. They, they, they're originating or, or distant to another country. So, um, yeah, so a lot of our activities overseas. So we what we found was the um, the setup of tracking. Uh, as you would imagine here, we're really talking primarily, we're talking diesel burn and jet fuel burn here in the United States, as you know, in North America, that's our, our primary focus. It gets a little more complicated when we start looking at uh, steamship lines and, and uh, obviously, as you know, we're not flying the planes or piloting the ships. So um, it gets a little more complicated to track, but uh, certainly it's achievable. It's, it's really, you're getting into using these science-based targets and, and using material that's already out there to help you define what the carbon footprint of a transaction is. If you have a certain amount of kilos flying to Frankfurt, Germany, you can work out how much carbon footprint you're, you're, you're making based on the aircraft type and so on. Um, and again, that's working, going back to your great point earlier, it's working with, uh, with good vendors that are able to provide you with information around that too, so. Yeah, definitely. Uh, what are the, you, do you think from, and even maybe these are mistakes your company has made and you've learned from, but what are common mistakes that occur when businesses do try to strategize these type of sustainability programs and how could they avoid those? Yeah, I think uh, this is another great question. I think, first of all, you know, thinking that you don't need a plan or thinking you already have some version of sustainability in place is uh, can be perhaps maybe a, a slightly um, cavalier approach. Um, I think we in the logistics industry, we're by our nature, we're problem solvers. So we often think we can fix things on the fly and uh, we can deal with the issue when it's needed. Uh, that's a little bit about how we operate. But a, but a sustainability program, a, a proper, uh, well-executed sustainability program is actually a roadmap. It's a strategy. And um, it doesn't happen overnight. The goals in that program don't happen overnight. So you don't think you already have a plan. Um, I second, I would just say, don't skip any steps in the development of your process. Um, try to uncover all factors and bring them to the table. You can always adjust later if you're focused on, you know, eight initiatives or nine initiatives or whatever, however it might be. You can always adjust as you travel over the, the, the following months and years. Um, but there are no short, shortcuts to a high quality uh, sustainability program. And just finally, I would just say, uh, and this is most important and certainly most important to me, uh, don't skip on getting feedback from your entire organization uh, as you build your process. We learned a lot from our teammates, and uh, I would definitely say don't assume that you know their, their opinions on the, you know, the subject matter around sustainability. I think that's important. Of course, and I think the best question is, well, what are you most proud of with AIT and your sustainability uh, program so far? Uh, thanks for that question. That, I, I would say that um, our ability to report on carbon footprint calculations at the file and transaction level is super exciting. Um, some of that initiative, first of all, it's it's us being able to report on, our, our, on ourselves, but also it's being able to report to a customer and delivering for a customer and being world class. Is, it's very important that we're able to show our customers that we're involved in that process. Many are asking about you know what their carbon footprint looks like. So they want to know that and to be able to deliver on that, that's meaningful when other companies don't, can't or won't, um, uh, you know, is, uh, is, is, is phenomenal. But really, I think the final part was the engagement that we got from our teammates as we engage various, uh, you know, stakeholders from around our organization. Um, and, and we began to work with them. I was personally, I learned a lot about how our teammates think about the company and think about where we're going more importantly. And, you know, at the end of the day, how can that be anything but a, a super great benefit to, to know how your people think about what you're doing and, and if you're being impactful in, in your direction? 
Now you're giving me chills, right? So that's it's incredible. And I'm excited to see that you guys are at the forefront of this, especially as you start to build out even more of that global footprint. It becomes a bigger deal as well. So thank you so much, Ray, for joining us today. And everyone else, enjoy the rest of today's summit.